Instagram. Um, send your um, question in the chat and um, Deborah will get to as many as possible at, at the end. And with that, I will hand it over to our executive director, Denise Cardozo. Thank you, Mandy. And hello to everyone who joined us today. And we hope that you and your families are all staying safe and healthy. As she mentioned, my name is Denise Cardozo and I'm the executive director of Silicon Valley Forum. Before we get started, I would like to just briefly tell you a little bit about our organization. So Silicon Valley Forum is a 37 year old nonprofit supporting and educating the global technology and startup ecosystem. So what that means is we create content and organize over 70 programs and events per year, helping startups in their journey. So everything from I have an idea to what's my exit strategy and pretty much everything else in between. We also focus on initiatives around women in tech, agriculture and sustainability, the future of work, emerging technologies, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. For more information about our work and other programs we organize, please check us out at siliconvalleyforum.com and also startupedia.info, which is a free resource for startups and budding entrepreneurs. We are excited for today's discussion, which is managing your money during post COVID-19 era, a very important conversation to have now and really so much to unpack in just over the next hour. We are honored to have Allison Kvitstad, financial advisor at Elevis as today's speaker. And our host for today is Debbie Brackeen, chief strategy officer at CSAA Insurance. And with that, I will turn it over to Debbie. Thank you, Denise. Good afternoon, everyone. Super excited to be here with all of you this afternoon and uh, especially around an important topic. And we are so fortunate to have Allison as our guest speaker today. Uh, what we're going to do is basically, um, I'll have Allison introduce herself in a moment. She has a very impressive background. She's not only a certified financial planner, but I know she's worked at Wells Fargo and U.S. Trust and some other fantastic organizations. So we couldn't have a more qualified expert to help us through the discussion today. Um, and Allison, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and then uh, we'll kick it off after that. Yeah, I, and I will say if, if the participants can, um, while I'm introducing myself, um, grab maybe a pen or pencil and a piece of paper, uh, it would be great because I hope there's a couple of uh, key tasks that people can do that'll help them by the end of this call. Uh, but I'm happy to be here. It's an honor. I've attended some of your events. Uh, so it's, it's just a pleasure to be here and helping the community. I have over 25 years of financial services experience. It makes me feel very old. Um, I would say in the last two months, 60 days, 90 days, it has made me um, really think about, do I want to stay in financial services um, with this kind of volatility? But it is a area that I love. I have mostly focused on helping people with wealth create more wealth uh, take it to the next level and preserve it and help multi-generational families. So those are people with over a million or 5 million or 10 million. And while I was doing most of that at Wells Fargo and U.S. Trust, I started to get a little jaded coming from a very low socioeconomic background myself, started to do more volunteer work and financial literacy with Dress for Success in San Francisco and in San Jose, and then realized in doing that, you know, we really need to touch girls, not touch girls, but impact girls and how they think about finances earlier. So started doing more and more financial literacy for Girls Inc. in Oakland. Um, financial literacy is something that is, you know, very true to my heart. And the more women that are engaged and knowledge um, and empowered about money, I think the better society is as a whole. Awesome. Well, we're so excited to have you with us to um, share some of your knowledge. Um, so what we're going to do, I think Allison has just a small number of slides to kind of cover some fundamentals that will help, I think, anchor the conversation throughout the rest of the hour. And then we'll just jump into Q&A after that. So Allison, if you want to pull your slides up. I would love to do that. And this will not, I promise, it will not be death by PowerPoint. Um, you know, by no means is it that. It will certainly be just a couple of, uh, I think, key eye-opening, 
maybe charts. And with that, I'm hoping everyone can see this now. I can see it. Okay, great. Um, so we, we often talk to large groups of women about money as power and money giving people the control, the options in life. And some people really, you know, Debbie, think, think of this as a uh, taboo, you know, it's, it's not money doesn't make you happiness, but what money does is it gives people options. It gives people choices. Um, I said earlier, I, you know, very low socioeconomic paid my way through undergrad and graduate. Um, school, both for finance degrees, and learned early on that money does give you so many more choices. I was able to, with some semblance of money and financial security, navigate a divorce, navigate breast cancer, uh, navigate raising a child who has a disability, and helping care for parents who also are on the low socioeconomic. So money does certainly help empower people. And for women, it is something that we are not socialized around and the discussions around money early on in our life. So um, we are with my firm, Elevest, really trying to go out and promote financial literacy, get women to a point where they are investing more in their investment accounts, in their retirement accounts earlier in their lives. Um, we talk a lot about this gender investing gap. And I'm, I'm pretty certain, and people can chime in on the chat, that people have heard about the pay gap, right? Where we make 80 cents to what a man makes. And if we're a woman of color, wow, it's even closer to 60 cents to what the men make for the equivalent jobs. And we'd like to say that we're getting better and better with this every year. It, it's a very slow progress that we're making. So it's not that we don't have access to money, we do, it is that we are coming to the investment arena much later in life, earning less over our careers, leaving the workforce at different points of our times. I don't know, to take care of kids, uh, maternity leave, take care of parents, a spouse, our own self. Um, and what is crucial, and that's really this, this left kind of point in green, is that we keep 72% of our investments in cash. We are not coming to the investment arena as quickly as the men are in their careers. So whether it's you know in our 20s and our 30s, we are holding back with investing. And some of that is just basic knowledge. We need to get to the point where we're more comfortable. We're more, um, I don't wanna say fearful, but um, hesitant to actually give up control and start investing. And there's so many different reasons why uh, we hold back and we'll, we'll go over some of that. But Basically, what the gender investing gap is, is that we don't invest often as men do, early as men do. And when we go to retire, we're retiring with one third less than men have. Um, so it's, it's, you know, for this conversation, I'm hoping people are able to take away three to five key points in financial, you know, health, wellness, that um, they can start doing some things tonight. So the problem, really um, why it's been that women have been underserved by the financial services industry. Uh, if we look across statistics, half of the women, more than half of the women haven't ever had a financial advisor. And when they do, they haven't really felt um, understood or listened to. So we're trying to change that. Um, not so much wanna make it a plug for LOS, but there are a lot of financial institutions that are out today helping people get investment knowledge, financial planning knowledge. And so that's what we're gonna to try to focus on. So a couple key points on the, the high level financial planning that will get you started uh, with maybe more comfort in investing is before you do anything else um, in the financial world, it's really tackling debt, right? That's really before you can go forward is looking at high interest rate credit card and looking at and I think, I don't know, is that shrunken, Debbie? It looks good to me. It looks okay. the same. Okay. Um, high interest rate debt. So that would be debt that is over seven, eight, nine percent And I would stop here that if people have student loans and they're federal student loans, you may right now be getting a deference, which is great, where the government has said, you know what, you don't have to pay any interest for a while. Those are great. If you have refinanced your student loans, and you're at a private bank, um, not a public institution, 
uh, but you know, somebody like a First Republic where you've refinanced your student loans, you may not have the ability to push back interest, uh, but you certainly have the ability to contact them and see if they would lower or freeze your interest payment. So there are active things that you can do with debt, even with credit card debt. Um, people are doing things with their mortgages if they have to, but it is, you have to be somewhat your own advocate, spend some time on the phone and, and finding how to navigate getting debt down. The second kind of uh, step in line of order of an operations or importance of what you need to do for your financial health is establishing the emergency fund. This is for all people, men, women, across all different socioeconomic levels, but it's having an emergency fund, a repository of cash that might be three, six, could be nine months of cash that is sitting in a checking or high interest rate savings. I say that and then I, I kind of nod because really interest rates have gone so low that there's really not, it's difficult to find a high interest rate savings account today, but it is just a place where you can go where if something happened, you have cash readily available to take and pay the mortgage, pay rent, pay whatever emergency that has come up. This is a key, and I put it on the slide so that people really hammer, you know, understand if everyone in the United States had an emergency fund of three months or six months or nine months, the economic crisis wouldn't be as such because they would have some ability to kind of um, pay the rent, pay the mortgage and such. So very hard to do both of these if you're just starting out and you have high student loans and you're trying to live a place here in the Bay Area, it's very difficult to do. So, the, but there are not-for-profit um, companies that can help you renegotiate your high interest rate credit cards if you have them. And it's something that, um, you know, I'm happy to share afterwards with people who, if they have this, that interest. The other is that emergency fund, again, three to six months, could be six to nine months. For myself, I made a major career change a couple of years ago. I had two years of an emergency fund. And so what that is, is if you make, um, you know, I happen to know that my, let's say my living expenses are $5,000 a month and it, I'm a single mom raising a son. He eats everything in sight. Mm -hmm. So if my emergency fund, um, I wanted to supplement that by six months, I would look at how much I need to live off of per month, which is $5,000 a month. This is hypothetically times that by six. So for me, my emergency fund would be at minimum $30,000. Uh, again, this is one where if you all of a sudden know you're going to go on maternity leave or your contract employee, um, you're only a one um, employed, you know, one person in your household is employed, you may want to increase that to, it could be nine months of an emergency fund. So this is the key question. We have a lot of people kind of want to know, okay, I've paid down some debt. Um, I've got an emergency fund. How do I think about investing? How do I even begin? And really it's having some kind of plan, regardless of if you're in your 20s and you're just starting out or you're in your 60s and you're thinking about retiring. It's what is your overall plan? How Your budget, what do you bring in? in terms of income and what do you spend? What's going out? What are the assets that you have? A retirement account, 401k, IRA, car, home, art, jewelry. Um, what are investable assets? And then what do you owe? What's the debt? And so for everyone, if they've got that pen and paper um, and you happen to know, if you don't know, then this is a to-do for later after this call, is write down what you have or what you think you have in take home income per month, right? So if you think, well, I, I take home after taxes, $5,000 per month, right? That's not what you spend, but that's what you take. That's what you earn. So $5,000 a month, um, multiply that by 12. So $60,000, right? And then from that, 80% of that $60,000 theoretically would go to the rent, to the mortgage, to the needs, right? So that, that's food, uh, insurance for your car, for your home. 
and and then maybe some wants it's nice to have some personal items in there that, that you like look i really need to get my hair done once every in this case three months because we don't have <laughs> um but some necessities in there and then the debt minimums and then with the rest of that budget you should be focused on and again this is an order of operations first debt pay down and then savings that that's that emergency fund and then you're thinking about investing right your future you your grandma you uh what it's going to look like in your retirement it's really hard to do that if you're in your 20s and your 30s but if you think about tucking money away and that money growing and the compounding of returns that you can have with investing those small incremental investments that you're making early in your career right in your 401k or your ira do in fact help you and supplement your retirement and this is the key difference again where women often we find in their 20s 30s and 40s are holding back and holding cash instead of investing into actual stocks and bonds for their future debbie are there any questions on this no questions yet on the on the um, chat but just as a reminder to everybody if you do have questions is allison is going um through the slides here just feel free to type them into the chat and i'll keep an eye on that so one or two comments also on this so this is where people as they start working out and you know they're in their 20s and okay i'm making fifty thousand dollars a year now i'm making one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year and now i'm making 250 right whatever the incremental growth increases in their salaries they are not often adjusting what they're tucking away to their future to their 401ks to their iras or to supplemental investment accounts those are just extra investment accounts and they often spend you know they have spending increases and it's not often something that is reevaluated every year as it should be so again if you have that piece of paper and you're like okay well my my take home meaning after tax income is $150,000 okay 20% of that is $30,000 and if i know that i'm putting the maximum in my 401k which is $19,500 a year are you in fact making up the difference right roughly eleven thousand dollars into an extra investment account or are you taking that extra eleven thousand dollars and spending it on you know items that you may not actually need so it's something that if you can start small even if you can start with one percent two percent three percent tucking that away into a retirement account or a future you know growth investment account for you it does in fact help you over the long term So one key thing we hear a lot of people focusing on is, well, I'm investing and they're looking at their 401k and they're not actually investing. They have money being taken away out of their paycheck every two weeks into a 401k, but they may not be investing, actually making the selection. So I'm hopeful that most of the people here in the Bay Area are with a company that is making those adjustments and, and helping them get to an investment strategy. A lot of 401k companies will use target date funds. A target date fund is just a investment vehicle that matches the time horizon of which you think you're going to retire, let's say in 2050, and it'll give you the right allocation or the right mix of stocks and bonds that tie into what's gonna get you a good growth rate for that retirement date so that's somewhat of the difference between investing and savings savings is you're just putting that money in cash checking account savings account or it's sitting in your retirement account not invested now with investing and especially over the last two three months we know for certain that it entails risk right if you put ten thousand dollars into the stock market in your 401k on february 15th you would have seen a dramatic swing in that value throughout March and then coming back up in April, but a lot of whipsaw, you know, just whiplash. So investing in the stock market does entail risk. It's not guaranteed, but if you have a long enough time horizon, right? If your time horizon is, look, I'm not gonna retire for 10, 15, 20 years, 
you should invest a portion of your future, your retirement assets into the stock market to get you what is called the compounding of returns, which is basically growth on last year's growth and the prior year's growth. So it's growing and growing every year. Savings, I think this was done a few months ago where the average savings interest rate is about 0 0.08. I don't know, Debbie, you might know if there's any high yield <laughs> savings accounts today. Um, <laughs> But, but this you know, offers you very little risk. So if you have a goal with your cash or your investments that, well, you know what, I have someone, my son will go to college hopefully in 14 months. I need to have a portion that is sitting in cash for him. I can't have it all invested in the stock market. So for all of you, you know, as you're writing down, well, what's my budget? What do I spend each month? What do I bring in in terms of income each month? You should have some kind of, budget written down or on a spreadsheet if you're a spreadsheet guru. And then also understanding what do you owe, what are the interest rates that you owe, those can be written down as well. And then looking at differences here of, okay, well, if I'm earning less than 1% on my savings account and that goal for that money is not to be used in one year, two year, three years, then the question is, are you going to be better off investing it for the long term in your investment account? Allison, we have had a question come in um, from Melissa. What are some easy ways to get into investing outside of a 401k? That is a great question. So within the financial services industry, you can go a few different ways. You can hire a broker at a brokerage firm, let's say like a Merrill Lynch and Bank of America, and Wells Fargo has them as well. And that is where it is a transactional based relationship. So Debbie, what do you want to buy? Oh, you want to buy Amazon. Okay, I'll sell you some Amazon. And it is a very much back and forth transactional type of relationship and you might pay a commission for that. That is one strategy. The other would be to employ a registered investment advisory firm or person. And that person hopefully is acting as a fiduciary mm -hmm. and is taking your um, goals into consideration, really? Okay, what do you need? What is this money for? When are you going to need this money, right? They're going to understand what your goals are, and then they're going to invest on your behalf. So within the financial services firm, you have companies like Elevest, which has a robo-advising software algorithm, very easy to use digital investment tool. So you can go in and you can hire a company like Elevest or Betterment, or Wealthfront, even Vanguard and Fidelity and Charles Schwab to manage your assets on your behalf. And you would go through, right, really some steps to put in your age, your zip code, maybe your salary and, and certain goals that you might have, right? This money isn't used for 10 years. So have them set up an investment portfolio for you. What is crucial is that you need to understand what the fees are associated with that and if the goals are specific to you. You don't want necessarily your goals to be the same as 200 other investors if you're different age and you have different objectives. So robo-advising firms, um, and that's where it's, it's simply um, very low cost, very transparent type of investing that is easy for people to get invested and start kind of getting the entree into investing. It doesn't have to be through a retirement account. It could be in your own individual name or husband and wife or a trust. And what is, I think, important about those is that's a great way to get you more experience with investing. You can start with $5 a month, $50 a month, 5,000 a month. You can really get to a point where you're gaining more and more comfort with investing. And obviously, one of the key differences with uh, between that and the 401k is the tax advantages of the 401k. Correct. Correct. And so this is, we, we have a lot of people who look at, you know, should I invest in a taxable account versus a 401k? And some of this is really dependent on your current tax situation. If you have a company-sponsored 401k and they're going to match, right? So if dollar for dollar or up to a certain percentage I've uh, worked with a lot of people at Google. They have a great employer match. So if you have a 401k with a company and they're going to give you any kind of match, you should do that, especially to the amount that they'll match. That's basically free money that they're giving to you for your future. So 
uh, no one should be taking um, that for granted. And then there's the, the questions that people look at investing, you know, a Roth IRA versus a traditional IRA. Some of that is very dependent on your current tax situation, right? How much you pay in taxes um, and how much you think you're going to pay in taxes or what tax bracket will you hit when you go to retire? We have another question on taxes actually from Kale Ferris. How are we taxed on investment income? If it is not a retirement account and you, let's say you buy a broad index, which is the S and P 500 index and you buy it at a hundred dollars and it goes up to 120 one month, it goes down to 110 the next month. It's going back and forth. Right. And you haven't sold it. You still just own it in your account. Those companies within those that exchange traded fund or that mutual fund, but that index, they are paying dividends. You would be taxed on whatever dividend income came into that account from that holding. You're not taxed on a capital gain or law, you know, not even given a tax um, benefit from a capital loss until you actually turn around and sell that security. And that is for, again, a taxable account. If you have a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA or a 401k, and there is a buying and selling that is being done in one of those retirement accounts, you may not pay any taxes on the capital gains in those. Allison, I don't know if you have any more slides that you wanted to get through. Just the one that, you know, we get into the saving versus investing. And this is really just, you know, so often I think um, I was quite lucky in that my first job was in 401k world. And I, I really had the benefit of seeing people who did tuck money away every month, right? Even if it's $25 a month towards your future, you can see here the trajectory of how your assets can grow. Um, women hold off and don't invest and wait because we think we need to know everything about the stock market or about a certain investment um, before we go forward. So it's, that's kind of one e easy textual chart that people can see. Yeah, it's a good visual. You know, you were talking about um, sort of the order of operations, you know, kind of the right priority, especially if you're early and starting out. So if you have uh, credit card debt, which uh, if you can't pay your credit card bill every month, then unfortunately the debt accumulates and then it's, that pushes the, the sort of yardsticks down the field you know, by when you can pay that off. Um, for somebody who's starting out, uh, let's say you have some credit card debt or maybe it's student loan debt and you're starting a job that does have a 401k match. Um, so you get the benefit of the pre-tax dollars and free money from your company. Yes but you have this debt, what, what strategies would you encourage people to think about in that today, scenario? Um, today, credit card companies are really bending over backwards and, and they're helping their customers. So one, I would be an advocate for yourself and contact the credit card company and see if one, they'll lower your interest rate or if they'll freeze, right? Especially if you're trying to um, just get a handle of what's, you know, there's someone said post COVID world. And I'm like, are we post yet? I feel like we're still in it. I don't know that we're post. Um, but I would say, you know, try to get a handle on lowering the overall interest rate if you can. And so I know on our website, Elevest, you can go in and there's a snowball method and an avalanche method to paying off your debt. And you can look about those right on a piece of paper or again, spreadsheet the interest that you owe, you know, if you own multiple different credit cards, um, rank them high to low and okay, how are you gonna tackle? Is it the highest interest rate first versus the lower credit card? The other is if you feel you're at a point where you can't go forward, you can contact some of those not-for-profits to get them to help reestablish a credit card payment kind of reduction completely. The other is um, the trade-off. You've looked at your budget and now you want to take advantage of that 401k and yet still pay your credit card. It is one where you start small maybe and you're, you're paying at least the minimums on your credit card. At least the minimums. Maybe call, try to see if you can renegotiate those. Pay the minimums on those and then start small with your 401k if you can't. 
Can you do 1% of your take home pay? Can you do 2%? As you get a raise, right? A 1%, 2% raise, can you add that raise to your 401k contribution? Love it. Um, I wanted to ask you about credit scores. Yes. I think of credit scores like somebody's financial reputation, basically. Uh, the better your credit score, the better interest rates you get if you're lucky enough to have enough money to buy a house, et cetera. Um, and, you know, I'm curious, in this kind of situation that's unprecedented, for sure, this pandemic, are credit rating agencies more lenient in any way? So, which is kind of an interesting question, but what strategies, as a lead up to, what strategies would you have for people about managing your credit score um, to the extent you can during a situation like this? I, this is so crucial. So one, I've been told and we've read that, um, you know, defaults, defeasance, loan, uh, that, that banks are being a little more forgiving right now. So this is one where as I've gone in and done financial literacy for Dress for Success, you know, Girls Inc., I can't stress enough that you are your own advocate. You might have to sit on the phone and speak to the credit card companies, um, or if you think something has been fraud uh, or some kind of incorrect action on one of your credit reports, you need to pick up the phone and spend a lot of time, unfortunately, trying to get that reestablished. Um, if someone is young and they haven't yet established credit, you can have your landlord, right? And you're paying rent and you're paying it on time. There is a way that they can help you establish credit by saying, yes, this person has rented on time and there can be a letter that goes to your credit agencies. But um, for what I have read, um, there is a little more forgiveness right now. And it is not supposed to be a ding on your credit. Um, this is where I think it is a little state to state and what financial institutions one bank is doing in New York is a little same bank is doing something slightly different in California, which I thought interesting, but um, different banking regulations, I guess, state to state in terms of what they can do. But it is one where you have to be truly your, your number one advocate to say, okay, I've got a list. I've written down my debt. I've written down who I owe, what, how do I make the minimum payments or not? you can call those credit card companies, try to get a freeze if you, you know, if they'll allow it to, but anything you could possibly do to um, not have your credit score go down is optimal. Um, you talked about, I love this notion of people being their own advocates, um, does take a lot of time. Uh, <laughs> you know, and I, 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 I'm sure we've all seen the news reports of people trying to file their unemployment claims or just get a hold of their mortgage company about deferring payments, whatever. Um, let's say somebody wants a coach, uh, you know, a financial advisor. How do you, what advice do you have for folks on how to pick a, an advisor that's best for you? Well, and that's a great question. And it goes across um, like somewhat, again, being your own advocate, because there are so many websites in this day and age that help people um, I think with all good intentions. And then there are some that are somewhat, um, you know, trying to get, oh, if you, if you give us, a, if you subscribe, you know, $100 to this newsletter, you know, it will make you rich, right? There is no quick and easy solution. It, it is have to be um, something where um, it might have to be customized for you and you might have to pay a little bit for it to get that. Um, the financial services industry is not a not-for-profit. Um, I think there are websites, so NerdWallet, I think, does a good job of kind of ranking what's the best credit card, what are the best ways to, um, you know, pick a robo-advisor. There are, you know, I think sometimes they do get paid for some of their research, but in other cases, you can see kind of ranking by um, truly investor's preference. The other is, you know, trying to do things um, a little bit at a time. So if you're trying to go and find a financial advisor, is it one where you actually need um, someone to help with your taxes? Or is it someone to help with, you know, um, if they have stock options, that kind of strategy? 
right? Understanding, okay, what is it you actually, like very specifically need? Um, your company 401k plan might have administrators who can help you, and that's a free service. There are financial planners, certified financial planners, who, unlike me, I work for a registered investment advisory firm. We do the investing for clients. Um, we also help with financial plans, but there are people like me who just do one-offs and all they help with is a financial plan. It could be $300, $600, $3,000. It depends on the scope. So if you're an individual or you're in a partnership, it's really writing down and having, okay, what is it we need? Um, you can save yourself some money if you've done that budget, if you've done some of the pre-work ahead of time. Mm -hmm. that okay. We have a couple of questions that have come in. One is, what are some of the tools that would help us be wiser um, about better facilitating the ominous family financial discussion? <laughs> oh, so uh, this is one of my bugaboos. Um, so my mom was a single mom, badass, but really knew nothing about money. It, so she'd come home, she was a waitress and a cleaning lady. She'd come home with wads of $1 bills from waitressing and say, okay, you know, put them in piles. We have to pay rent. We have food this week. I'm not sure, you know, but put them in piles. I think because we didn't have anything and there was no taboo, the more discussions you can have with your siblings, your friends, your coworkers about what you make, what you don't make. Hey, what does that job pay? Um, if you have kids or nieces or nephews, the more discussions around money, and really just like wiping away that taboo that it is this bad, nasty discussion, the better off everyone is. Um, I heard someone, this gentleman tell this, I don't know, 10, 11, his 10, 11 year old daughter, as she's asking about college and how much it costs, he just kind of pushed her, not pushed her off, but just said, you know, you don't need to worry about it, period. And I cringe because the discussion of money is so important. And if we don't develop the ability for all of us to have this discussion together, um, we're, not, we're not better off. So I think, you know, we talk about sex, we talk about death, talk about money. And if it's gonna be a difficult conversation, then you say, you know, to my girlfriends, I have a poker group, uh, you know, ladies, I, I wanna set up, I wanna have some discussions about money. So it might be uncomfortable, you know, Bring a cocktail if you need it. I don't know who drinks, but you know, getting, and especially in the financial situation about families and multi-generation, that is one where if you're in your thirties or your forties and you're trying to understand what's going to be passed to you or what your family has, it is really good for um, setting the right tone and finding the right time. It may not be in a big family gathering, but hey, dad, I'd like to know how you and mom set up a trust. I'd like to know how you and mom budgeted or bought the house. And ask, you know, asking those kind of thoughtful question, questions versus, hey, dad, tell me what you and mom have for investments. A little more crying. Yeah, in my own experience, I guess I'm one of those tweeners. I have a kid who's getting ready to go to college, but I also have a mom who's getting older. And generationally, she really doesn't want to have a conversation about her financial picture. So it's a little more challenging there, but um, we've broken the ice and it's like over time, it's gotten a little more comfortable, but it's so important to be on top of it. And it might be on you, right? To help support her. If you don't know, hey mom, how, how well have you planned for your future and your retirement? You know, what should I be prepared for? Yeah, exactly. Generation. It's difficult. Um, there was an, a question I realized I probably should have handled with, uh, at the, during the advisor conversation, but I think it's a good one. Is just going to an advisor at my bank an okay starting point? What are some of the questions I should be asking in that first session with a financial advisor? That is such a good, um, it is such a good question. So you, and, and if you have the pen and paper, you want to understand one, is the person acting as a fiduciary? Look it up. Uh, you can also go to Elevest website, what is a fiduciary? We explain that to people. What is a fiduciary? That person then has to act in your best interest. They cannot put their own interests ahead of yours. 
above anything else, they have to, you know, that they, you need them to be a fiduciary. If you go to an attorney, they're acting as a fiduciary. Um, so again, that's number one, are you a fiduciary? Write that down, look it up, you can go to our website. It's important to understand that one. Yes, the, the second, and I think this is um, across the board, is what are the fees? And I would ask this three or four or five different times. Okay, so what are the fees to the bank? Okay, what are the fees for any underlying investments? Uh, what are the fees for transactions? What are the fees if I close it? What are the fees for opening it, for my statement? You really wanna understand what the fees are. Um, again, I think NerdWallet does a good job because they'll do a comparison of five different institutions for let's say a robo-advising account. They'll give you what the fees are across the different entities. For a investment management account, you'll typically get management fees anywhere from 0.5% to 1.5%. That can seem like, you know, quite a bit of money. Um, for a lot of the robo-advisors, they're charging 0.25%. So 0.25% on, let's say, a $10,000 account is $25 a year. It's very low compared to maybe a 1%. So the robo-advising helps a lot. What it doesn't help with is someone needs a lot of hand-holding, right? So, mm -hmm. so that's kind of, if you're gonna need a lot of hand-holding, you're gonna pay more. Um, okay, so the fiduciary, the fees, you want to know um, what other services are included. Are they gonna buy and sell the securities for you? Uh, are they gonna do your taxes, right? You wanna understand exactly what services are you getting? And then their investment philosophy. So. Is it something where they're picking Amazon and Facebook, Coca-Cola, or are they buying you the broad market, the S&P 500, which is just the big 500 companies in the United States? Um, and then process. If the process doesn't start with you, the client at the very center, then something's wrong. And so that's by process. You want to make sure it's them asking all about you. One... Um... One question I had that might be on the minds of some of our listeners uh, in these interesting times where we're still mostly sheltered in place. Um, if someone has the money to be able to even contemplate buying a home, would right now be a really good or a really bad time to buy a home? If you have the financial means, if you have a job that is pretty secure, <laughs> which, you know, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> uh, if you have a job that is pretty secure, if you have a down payment, and if you've written down and done the financial steps to say, okay, I've got my financial situation all in order, now is a great time because uh, interest rates are very low. And you should be, if you have a good credit score and you've got the financial security, you should be able to lock in a very low interest rate mortgage. So I say home ownership is if it is truly you're purchasing real estate to live in, it is a tangible asset, something you get to touch and feel and experience every day. It's hard to do that with your 401k, you know, or a stock or, you know. You probably shouldn't touch your 401k. Every no, day. you shouldn't, but, but the home is something, especially today where we're, we're sheltered in place in our homes. Um, you know, it is, it is an important asset. If you were thinking about real estate as an investment, I'm gonna buy this, sell that. I'm gonna buy this, flip it. Um, historically, real estate as an asset class has underperformed the stock market. Mm -hmm. So, you know, from that perspective, there's a lot of risk. It's not liquid, meaning you can't turn around and sell it like you can if you own the broad stock market. And the historical returns are lower than just the broad stock market. Right trying to keep an eye on but it. I would I would also like this goes back to that budget and making sure can you afford it right all the extra bells and whistles that go with home ownership and the property tax which in California is outrageous um, and you can't deduct it anymore no you cannot so you know taking into consideration those factors we also had a related uh, but separate question, which is what about, is, is this a good time to sell a home if you have a home to sell? It, I think this is very dependent on where you live. 
and the demand. And if it's here in the Bay Area and we know that we have um, limited supply and a lot of people in the tech industry who still want to buy, who have a lot of cash and want to buy, you may be able to sell it. I have friends in Southern California and they have not been able to sell their homes. And these are, you know, million plus dollar homes. So um, if you have the ability to weather out the storm and wait, it may be prudent to do so. Um, the other question is, is, you know, were you looking to sell it and maybe you're selling it now at last year's value or two years ago? And is that okay? Is it still appreciated than when you bought it? So that's, that's somewhat, um, you know, region by region. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very location dependent. Um, just a reminder, if you have any additional questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat bot. Um, I have a question going back maybe to 401ks and retirement accounts. I know this is a question you probably get frequently. How should people think about the differences between a traditional 401k and a Roth? That is a great question. And a lot of people can do both. Um, it is entirely dependent on what your income is, right? If, if you're single or you're head of household, or you're uh, married filing jointly, there will be an income threshold to where you can invest in a Roth IRA um, and get some kind of, you know, or traditional IRA, then there's the Roth IRA and your 401k. Most people um, who have a company sponsored 401k, let's say if you make a $100,000 a year and you could put that $19,000, $19,500 into a 401k, your tax, your taxable income is basically reduced by that amount. So it is a nice benefit. If you're doing the Roth IRA, um, you have to make below a certain amount to make the, to get the, any kind of deduction and your money is going in and it's basically after tax. So you've already been taxed in it. And then it is growing over 20, 30 years. And when you go to take it out, there's no tax whatsoever on it. So it's a benefit if you think you're going to have a lower overall tax bracket in your 50s, 60s, 70s, whenever you do decide to retire. A lot of people today are converting old IRAs, traditional IRAs, and converting them to a Roth IRA and paying the ordinary tax on it in one year. Very hard to do if you're in a high tax bracket, but people are doing it. And then that money in the Roth IRA is then growing basically tax-free for their future. So they're basically taking, choosing to take the tax hit now Today. for right. the possibility of having that money not taxable later. This is one it is, um, there's so many different variables here and it's to each his own in terms of are you okay paying taxes now versus what you're going to pay in the future. If you, you know, Debbie, if you could tell me what we're going to pay in 10 years in taxes, that'd be great. I wish, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully not too much. <laughs> I would say, I know we, we um, I've had some other people ask about, um, you know, owning different types of invest in, investments. Do, you know, today Amazon is up versus Facebook um, versus owning just the passive market, which means owning the broad S&P 500. And um, a lot of people like to do that, especially in this COVID world, pick those winners. I want to own Clorox, right? Or Facebook. Um, it may pay off in the very short term, but as we look at long term, right? Um, owning the broad index, the broad mix of stocks, 500 stocks, 3000 stocks in the Vanguard total stock market index tends to outperform. And really there are very few investors like Warren Buffett. That's why we know Warren Buffett's name, <laughs> um, who have the ability to pick those individual securities over a long period of time and outperform the market. So what is more important is time in the market versus trying to time the market also. So getting in, getting out, you know, trying to be too cute with when you get in and out. And uh, if you're paying attention to fees, if you're trying to get in and out of the market, you're probably paying higher transactional fees. Yes, so. and maybe taxes. Yeah. So. We, we do have a couple of new questions yes. um, for Nancy. If I'm investing in a new business, should I have a separate financial advisor specifically for my business or do I include that in my conversations with my personal financial advisor? 
I would first have it with your personal financial advisor, but I would make sure they have an understanding of business taxes. And it might be something where you're partnering with your personal financial advisor and maybe your, your business CPA or accountant so that um, you, know, you are not hurting yourself in terms of a tax situation by selling the business or investing in the new business and how the income is going to be generated. You want to make sure kind of both components of your balance sheet, the business and the personal side are lockstep. Cool. Uh, we have a couple more follow-ons to looks like the Roth IRA topic. Mm -hmm. First question, I'm going to give them to you both at the same time. First question is, can you discuss backdoor Roth IRAs? What I just was talking about. Yes. And the second question is, when you're in retirement, will you have to cash out a certain percent of your Roth IRA as you go from year to year? Um, so the backdoor Roth is what I was just talking about, where let's say I make over the threshold to get a deduction or an exemption for, and I can't, let's say for tax purposes, get any benefit today by investing in a Roth. So what I could do is invest in a traditional IRA, put $6,000 in, um, and maybe then decide in a month to convert the Roth, the traditional Roth to a, I'm sorry, the traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, pay ordinary taxes on if there were any gains throughout that. Um, and that's what people are doing basically because they want that Roth money to grow over a long period of time, free and clear of taxes. But you might be paying a good amount of taxes in, in this one year, the year of the conversion. And then when you get to retirement and you start taking money out of your Roth IRA, do you have to take out a certain percent each year? No. So um, there are not required minimum distributions like there are with a traditional IRA. And the traditional IRA, they've also bumped that instead of 70 and a half, it's now 72 and a half. But there is not the required minimum distributions with the Roth. You've already paid the taxes. So that's one reason why people are doing the backdoor conversion, I guess. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Uh, let's see, I'm just keeping an eye on the clock here. We have about seven minutes. I, I wanted to go back to, um, I guess, the current situation that we're in, which is certainly unique. Um, you know, there's so many people laid off, reduced hours, you know, whatever's going on. Maybe one of the income earners in a household has lost their job. The other one's still, you know, fortunate to be able to work remotely, whatever. Um, are, are, you know, I think some of the fundamentals that you talked about in the beginning apply for sure. I mean, it would have been good to already have in place, paying down debt, having a rainy day fund. Are there things in particular, aside from those right now, that you think are really critical for people to be focused on? I would say have a plan, um, period. You know, people have emergency plans for, okay, if my house goes on fire, have some kind of plan, communicate it with your partner or parents or kids or whoever. But so you have almost a support for that plan and hold yourself accountable to it. Is it every month? Is it every quarter? But you have to have a budget across all socioeconomic levels. You have to understand what you own and what you owe, O-U-E, O-W-E. And um, it's not too late to do that. And I wouldn't be discouraged, even if you're like, well, I haven't done it yet, it's too late. It's, you still have time. Um, that is one where the more people who can get access to the information, spend a little time doing the research, um, writing out, okay, you know, here's my, I'm hoping people at least did write down what my taxable income is, what maybe my spent expenses are, or my needs are month to month, and then saying, okay, do I need three months or six months? Um, having that basic plan of how you're going to go forward in the next step is, I think, crucial. Um, what is hard, Debbie, is that people often don't know, well, where do I begin? Mm -hmm. So that's why some of those first charts is, okay, what do you own? What do you owe? Writing down to budget. It's hard. People are like, well, how do I do a budget? You go through your bank statement and you write down, what did you spend on everything in the last month? What was gas? What was food? What are things you needed? What are things you wanted? Um, I think this last 60 days 
people have really been able to look at what they spend and maybe what they were spending, you know, look at your spending in November or October last year. I wouldn't say December, but it would be a good comparison to look at October and November versus April, May yeah. and see what kind of um, key components did they spend more on or spend less on, more on garden, uh, less on hair and makeup. <laughs> less on eating out, yeah. sort of, unless you're getting delivery. Right. Um, That's it. I mean, from a planning perspective, it's, um, you need to have some kind of understanding of, of budgets. A couple things that I wanted to, to mention, and then um, maybe I'll hand it back to you, Allison, to give people some, maybe some suggestions for different resources. But uh, since I work for an insurance company, we don't offer this product, so I'm not marketing. But one thing that I am aware of is, uh, unfortunately, with the situation that we're in right now, um, there's a lot of fraud going on and a lot of identity theft. Um, so if you, you know, one thing you want to do as you're making a plan is just make sure that you're monitoring your credit score if you can. And if you have access to a service, uh, there's lots of them. LifeLock is probably the best known one that does identity monitoring. You know, you, with everybody working from home, unfortunately, I know phishing and cyber attacks are happening at, at like a thousand fold. I mean, it's several hundred times normal rates, um, unfortunately. So uh, you want to keep an eye out for that. But uh, Allison, what are some, you know, you've mentioned Nerd Wallet, you've mentioned people being an advocate for themselves and calling their credit card companies or their student loan. Um, uh, servicers to, or even mortgage servicers to see what they might be able to negotiate. Are there some other resources that you might recommend for people to check out as they're beginning to put pen to paper and at least starting to make a plan for themselves? I, I think um, because we have the internet and things are so public, if you're investigating a bank, a financial institution, an individual as an advisor, a certified financial planner, an insurance, right? trying to go through and really investigate or look at that person or that company and how do they serve their clients. Um, then in terms of protecting your assets under, or at the digital side, understanding what is it that they do to protect from a security standpoint. Um, I know we started off as a digital firm. We were primarily working remotely. So the transition for us the, the advisors such as myself and my firm was very easy. We already had very secure portal and, and very ease of access. Um, when I talked to people who were more in, uh, you know, in a, a physical building and they didn't have a VPN and they didn't have the laptops, it was a harder transition for them. So for all of you, as you're looking, you know, to invest or with credit cards is trying to understand what are the protections in place by these entities, these companies, the individuals to help protect your data. Um, and I think like you mentioned, you know, reaching out to some of those companies, um, even the credit agencies, the Transfax, Equi Union, is that right? I forget those three. Equifax, Trans Equifax TransUnion, I flipped. Experian them. might be the other one. Yeah. They all sound the same. Right. So even contacting them, if you do have fraud, if you do have something, you need to be the first one who's reaching out. Yeah, for sure. Well, we're coming up at the top of the hour here and I don't see any new questions. So um, if I had just stressed though, like establish some goals, establish what's this money for, um, and you know, pen to paper, what is it you spend? Do you have the emergency fund? Do you have the debt situation taken care of? And then how do you start investing? Is it five months, $5 a month, $50, right? Get yourself started slowly. Yeah, even if you just do a small amount, I think just getting started is probably one of the most important things. And one of the um, tips that I got early on that I'm so grateful for is just think of savings as paying yourself, you know, as paying yourself, as taking care of yourself, it, especially right. for women, since we know there's an investment gap and an income gap. Um, don't, you know, we, we have, it's easy to put everybody else, else's needs above our own. So it's so important to make sure you're paying yourself for the future and savings and investment. Right. 
with that, I think we'll call it a wrap. Um, thank you all who joined. Thank you so much, Allison, for sharing your expertise with us today. Um, I can see that we could go for another hour or two. <laughs> so um, thank you all very much. And uh, thanks to SV Forum for hosting this conversation. Yes, thank you, Allison, and thank you, Debbie. And I, I, I feel like my head is exploding. I'm leaving here with no pun intended, but a wealth of information. But at the same time, so many other questions. So, Allison, we would love to have you back again. I love it. <laughs> Master class. Absolutely. And thank you for everybody who joined us today. And we hope to see you at other Silicon Valley Forum events. So, thank you so much, and hope everybody has just a great week. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye.